So the aim of this short video is to discuss the role of dimensional analysis in integration. And I'm going to start off with the key message. Let's assume that the variable which we're going to integrate over, which I'm going to call x, has a dimension. And let's say it has dimensions of length, just to be specific. Now, if our function, function of x, has some arbitrary dimension, l to a power, let's call it a, then the integral of this function with respect to x will have dimensions which are the dimensions of the function, the integrand, multiplied by one additional power of the dimension of the variable. So that's the key result. So we're going to understand why on the next slide, and we're going to look at three examples, all of which I have written down here. So in this case, this would have dimensions of L to the N, so it would add, when we add one to the power, we add one here. I put this in red. This is explained by our result. It does not explain why there is an n plus one on the bottom, but it explains the increase in the power. What about this integral here? Well, you may know this integral and that it is an arc tangent. This line of argument will explain to us why there is a factor of 1 over a in front of the inverse tangent. And it will also explain to us why for this integral, which is an inverse sine, an arc sine, there is no 1 over a factor in front. So we're going to look at all of these, but first of all, let's just prove this result on the next slide. So to understand the result, let's look at the case of a definite integral understood as a Riemann sum. Now, the dimension of the definite integral is going to be equal to the dimension of this sum. And in a sum, if we are adding terms together, to add them, each term must have the same dimension as all of the other terms. Otherwise, it makes no sense to add two things together. So we don't need to worry about writing down the sum. We can just look at one individual term and what its dimensions are. So each term is the value of the function at some place inside the range of integration multiplied by the thickness of the step that we are taking. So if our function has dimensions like this and the thickness has dimensions like this, we can just factorize this. We just need to say that the function has dimensions L to the A. That's what we assumed on the last slide. Whatever it is, don't really care. And the thickness of the step is going to have the same dimensions as the variable x, because it's just a change in x. You can imagine it being just the difference of two values of x. So it's going to have dimensions of L, because that's our assumption. It could be something else. It could have dimensions of time or mass, but we're assuming here it's got dimensions of L. So then the dimensions of our integral are equal to, from here, L to the A, the dimensions of the function, multiplied by one additional power of L, because that's the dimension of the thickness, the step. So then using the rules for powers, that is L to the A plus one. So this, I think, is a lovely result. And one of the things that you sometimes see people when they're learning calculus forget to do is sometimes people don't write down the measure. They just forget about it. And obviously one should always write the measure, but I hope that thinking of it in this way, that the measure supplies a power of the dimension of the variable, assuming it has a dimension, will help you to always remember how important and significant the measure is in an integral.
But what I want to do in the rest of the video is to look at some explicit integrals, the three from the previous slide, and just see how we now understand them in terms of this result. So let's start off with this integral, which is probably one of the very first integrals that most people meet. So it's a class of integrals, x is raised to the power of n, and we integrate it with respect to x. Let's think about the dimensions of this indefinite integral. So it's going to be the dimensions of the integrand multiplied by the dimensions of the measure. So if x has dimension l, then we get from here l to the n, and from here l, so we add the powers together, l to the n times l to the 1. So we add them together and we obtain l to the n plus 1. So that is the dimensionality of the integral. So on the other side, if you look at the standard result for this integral, we have x to the n plus 1, and that would have dimensions of l to the n plus 1. So by thinking about dimensions, it gives us another way to understand why this power is increased by 1 in the result for the integral. So this is fixed by thinking about these things as dimensions. Dimensional analysis does not give us everything. It does not explain why there is a 1 over m plus 1 factor. Remember, to calculate this integral, you add 1 to the power, and then you divide by the new power. Also, you might be thinking, well, perhaps x isn't dimensionful, but even if it is dimensionless, you can pretend it has dimensions, and if it were to have dimensions, you would have to have x to the m plus 1 in the result. So I think that's a, a nice way of thinking about it. Finally, just to talk about one thing, remember in the previous slides we were looking at um, definite integrals, and you might be worried, well, hang on, this is an indefinite integral. So a different way of seeing this is the following. Supposing we say we have this integral, so an integral of, let's say, little f of x with respect to x, and it's going to be capital F of x plus some integration constant. Well, what that tells you is that the derivative of capital F of x, our result for the integral, must be the original integrand. Okay, so this is just, you know, very familiar theorems from calculus. But now, as discussed in the previous video of these two, if you differentiate a function, you reduce its dimension by one. So, if we say, if we want the dimension of f of x be let us say l to the n, we need the dimension of capital F of x, the integral, to be l to the n plus 1, so that the dimensions of the derivative of f of x Remember, we reduce it, the power by 1, and the power here is n plus 1, is going to be l to the n. So for the indefinite integral, we can also think of it this way, that this relationship between the derivative of the integral and the original integrand tells you that if you're going to reduce the power by one of this function when you differentiate it, it means that the integral capital F of x has to have one higher power than the original integrand. Okay, so let's look now at another example. So now I want to look at this integral. The integrand is one, which I've not written here, divided by a squared plus x squared. Because a squared plus x squared are added together, these two terms must have the same dimension. 
So if we say that the dimension of x is L, so x is a length, and that's a perfectly acceptable assumption, it could be something else, it might not even not have dimensions, but we could pretend it does and see what the consequences are. Then, because these terms are added, a squared and x squared have the same dimension, that means a and x must have the same dimension, Dimension of x, we've said, is going to be L, so the dimension of A is L. So now if we look at the dimensionality of the entire integral, we have the dimension of the measure multiplied by the dimension of the integrand, and the integrand is 1 over A squared plus X squared. So it's the dimension of the measure divided by the dimension of A squared plus X squared. These terms we've both agreed are both length squared, so their sum is length squared. So the dimensions are length from the measure over length squared from this denominator. The L and the L squared are going to partly cancel. The L will cancel with one of those two powers. So we obtain one over L and we see the overall result that the dimensionality of our integral is one over L. Now, the result for the integral, which you may know already, is that this integral has the form of 1 over a times the arctangent of x over a. The argument of the inverse trigonometric function is a ratio of two lengths. It's therefore dimensionless. The arguments of all such functions must be dimensionless. So this quantity the arctangent is dimensionless, but it is multiplied by a factor of 1 over a, and that factor of 1 over a is needed for various reasons, but one reason is the dimensions. If that was not there, the dimensions of these two sides would disagree, and we would know that, this, that the result without that factor would be wrong. And on the final slide, I'd just like to compare this with this integral here. So, again, let's assume the dimension of x is L. And let's look at this integral and calculate its dimension. So, again, we get dx from the measure. And then on the bottom, we have the dimensionality of the square root of a squared minus x squared a squared and x squared must again have the same dimensionality, so they're both going to have dimension of L squared, because they're squared. So the argument of the square root has dimensions of L squared. So from the top, we have a length, and on the bottom, we have the square root of length squared. Length over the square root of length squared is the same as length over length. The lengths will cancel, and we will be left with 1. So 1 means length to the power of 0. So this is a dimensionless integral. And this explains why in the result for the integral, which I've written down here, that this integral is arc sine of the dimensionless ratio x over a, there is no factor of 1 over a outside. Because in this case, if you had a 1 over a outside, this would be dimensionful. And this integral is dimensionless, and that is wrong. The dimensions of both sides of this relation have to agree. And that's why there is no factor like 1 over a there. So just to conclude, arguments like this tell you why there, there might be or might not be factors of a or a squared or whatever in results. They do not explain why there isn't a factor of, say, 3 out front. You have to understand that from other calculations. But I think dimensional analysis helps you very much to understand results. And finally, if you were to look at, say, this integral, dx over the square root of 1 minus x squared, and you wanted to understand its structure, you can't use dimensional analysis anymore because the 1 here and the x squared means that x must be dimensionless or the 1 carries a dimension that's hidden and you cannot see it in the equations. So 
very often if you're faced with something like that, it's actually more interesting to look at the general case and then you can use dimensional analysis to understand it. With that, I'll stop this video.